Well, I believe that it depends what we define as being a standard of living. So if we, I, I think my short answer is not if we continue to define a standard of living as being a set of expectations and norms around consumption, individual consumption, around gaps between rich and poor, um, around a, a set of norms and assumptions about growth and pro or prosperity linked to growth and to the increasing accumulation of material uh, goods and materials uh, and because of that as the underpinning value of economic merit or economic value or economic wealth uh, therefore the forgiveness of obsolescence and waste so do I believe that that's sustainable no I believe that that's a model designed for a world uh, in which there is a, an assumption that there are no limits uh, I also think we are assuming we have a couple of assumptions that are not that are traveling side by side and that are not connected which is that we can continue to expand as a population as a species within a planet as if it has infinitely expansive boundaries to hold us and at the same time hope and expect that every human being in that expanding population should have a set of expectations to live with a standard of wealth set at uh, aspirational um, targets perhaps promoted by media um, of the very wealthy and I think there is a, there are a set of disconnects there that are fundamentally wrong. We need to learn to live differently with a notion of value. I don't think that that means that we need to let go of a notion of standard of living and well-being. I think we need to reframe what we understand by value, well-being and prosperity and ultimately reframe for ourselves what is it that matters most that we still have a planet to live on, that we can continue, that there is equity and equality in the way in which human beings live with one another, that there is a relationship between us and the environment in which we live and the other species on which we are codependent. If you reframe that as a standard of living, yes, I believe it's possible, but it's a very significant mental switch. So that's a big question and there are a lot of different and multi dimensions to the answers. Um, most importantly I would argue that we need to, or certainly we as an organisation are trying to do this, we need to work on reframing uh, the question of living sustainably and of working within limits and within um, and in interdependency with the environment we work on, we live in, as the core object of design and of concern of the whole financial system. So well, for me, one of the keys to mobilizing the capital we need is to, is to redesign the financial system to bring within its purview the question of the sustainability of human existence, not the sustainability of individual businesses or more importantly the growth and return on investment in short time frames with, with significant multiples of individual businesses. If we were to do that and indeed those of us who are working to try and put in place the innovations to make that both possible um, and accessible to, to a set of normative changes then, well, then we have a financial system working um, and aligned with, with our ultimate interests. Now what that means is bringing demand finance to bear uh, together with supply finance and not only uh, bringing capital, venture capital to bear on new business ideas in the hope that one of them or more of them will turn out to be fantastic business opportunities and put them to capital markets, um, but more uh, start to bring in the combination of um, the financing mechanisms uh, to do with land value, to do with offtake agreements, to do with consumer and industrial demand, to do with pricing in the value of what it is that we are putting at stake, reversing the discounting mechanism, so instead of discounting the future in favour of the present, start to think about how would we begin to um, place a value on our ability to survive into the longer term. Um, thinking about pricing offsets, bringing together uh, perhaps a, a temporal perspective also in terms of deferred liability. So bringing some of the core structures of financial mechanisms that value, that are driving a demand for a different type of economic 
and technological solutions and marry that into the supply side of finance of capital investable opportunities. That's one. Secondly, I think it's fundamental for us to increase exponentially the, the, the quantity and quality of investable initiatives. Uh, whether they are single projects scaling up to millions of projects, whole cities, whole regions, whole districts, whether they are a conversion or intervention, redesign of entire supply chains and entire value systems, or whether they are um, a set of investable opportunities in terms of enduring relationships between landholders and land users, or across generations, if you take inspiration, for example, from the Welsh law of generations, and start to think about your investable perimeter as bigger than a single solution and more as a complex of multiple solutions working for a systemic effect over time. Uh, the more that we can create that as an investable perimeter, define it as an investable perimeter, uh, the better. Uh, and then of course there's regulation. There is the, the standard setting, the rule setting, the norm setting that comes from the regulatory system to define what value is and to define how we value it and also to bring in to bear in our market dynamics what we understand by both of those things. For us, the core objective is systemic change, and it's valid across all. Uh, what we have seen from our nearly 10 years of operation is that, um, transform uh, that innovation, research and innovation very often defaults to single point solutions, technology focused or technology optimistic solutions, and very often actually incremental solutions and they are traveling in silos or you know we have energy substitution we have um, particular solutions around algae plants or water treatment or biomass or we have solutions in climate smart agriculture what we are not doing is managing and innovating at the relation at the interfaces in the relationships between these things starting to design the way in which we think about energy uh, in such a way as that it comprehends needs around waste and water and mobility simultaneously, or the way in which we think about urban construction and retrofit of, of historical buildings in such a way that it comprehends digital transformation and the need for health care for people increasingly in homes so that we also manage an ageing, growing population. So there are sets of relationships that we have an opportunity to design for. For Climate Kick, that is our core, our core focus to place innovation or have innovation work on systems transformation and systemic change so that we are looking for a much greater, a different approach to innovation, a spread of multiple possibilities, testing different relationships, potential relationships amongst solutions. So I believe that this is a very interesting uh, challenge around the relationship between global and local in, in what we are collectively attempting to do, both from the Paris targets, in fact the design of the Paris Agreement and the notion of individually determined national contributions and the ratcheting up of contributions is a, it's actually a very nice analogy for this opportunity and challenge. Um, Fundamentally, climate change is about changing human beings, human practices, habits, perceptions, values, norms, assumptions, ways of working, living, moving about. Uh, it's, not, it's, a, it's not changing the world around us, it's changing us. And for us to change, we need to be able to draw upon the sources of innovation and of mobilization that are very often specific to meaning, to identity, to context, to the assets, the, rela the, the resources that we have in individual places. Which means that there is a tension between the idea of uh, scaling as a virtue in of itself, that we have to find solutions that can be scaled. We have to find solutions that can scale down as well as up, that can scale to a scale where people are willing to act around them and mobilize around them. And at the same time, uh, we can scale learning, insight, uh, inspiration, practices that we can learn across. Climate Kick, in fact, is an organization sitting right at that interface and deliberately looking to uh, exploit and learn and work with the relationship between deeply specific hyper-local solutions that are about the meaning and the will to move in different, will to, to change in different places, and at the same time what's possible when you are 
uh, supporting that, that in multiple places mm -hmm. and where there are, s there, there are stories and narratives that, that can be mobilizing yeah. and inspirational or there are ideas and resources, modalities, methods, less than the single solution that scales for all, um, unless that in itself is actually technically part of the way in which we solve the problem. But I, in our work we are seeking to hold open the fact that it may and it may not be and different solutions will call for different possibilities of going up and down global local scales. So the, in terms of technological breakthrough and technological possibility, uh, there is a wealth of opportunity there. Um, there are fantastic and interesting promising breakthroughs in terms of hydrogen, um, not only in terms of hydrogen production, but particularly storage and transport, so commoditization of hydrogen as a solution for some of the big uh, hard to abate industries. There are very promising and exciting solutions in, in working with wood and particularly with lignine um, to be able to use wood in construction for high-rise buildings or for, uh, for a degree of flexibility and tensile strength similar to steel. So there, there's a set of possibilities there. There are um, uh, a, pl a plethora of solutions around agriculture, soil capture, carbon, some of them actually in some ways ironically not innovations at all other than beginning to apply en masse practices and techniques which we've known of thousands of years ago and in other cases um, uh, sets of genetic modifications or um, uh, genetic markers that help f uh, move towards biomimicry in fact, I would say biomimicry is one of the most interesting areas where we begin to learn how the structure of the organic world, its form and its function, would help us in our own understanding of the use of materials um, adapt more effectively or build or mitigate. Things like four-dimensional printing, printing uh, using additive manufacturing techniques to work with the properties of the material world to change itself. Uh, under different conditions and that as a, me as a mechanism for both climate adaptation uh, but also eventually in terms of new materials and nanotechnology. My caution uh, or at least the context in which we are working is one in which technology is essential uh, and it is not everything and if where the breakthroughs and, and, and systemic change and transformation will come in the relationship between technologies and processes and financing technology and behavior and, and value chains and the design of context. So individual technologies around energy substitution won't necessarily change the demand for energy, the increasing exponential demand for energy. Changes in behavior, planning and design will. So uh, there, is a, there is an interesting and a com intricate relationship between pure technology solutions and substitution solutions particularly um, the, ex the extraordinary possibilities of technology and the ways in which we put that together as a set of more complex social changes as well as the, the, the individual solutions. <laughs>